Hello, hello, welcome to week four. It's the week where there's really too much to cover and I'm at the end of a really long month of marathon engagements, meetings, webinars. So much so that I'm really asking why we're only at week four. But I think this is also the week where things are starting to get interesting and also increasingly complex. So last week, we looked at O.W. Walter's ideas on some of the shared characteristics that distinguishes Southeast Asia as a cultural unit. Um, of course, this is a theory uh, proposed by a scholar, and hopefully uh, we're going to think whether this theory actually makes sense or not uh, over the course of our study. Uh, principally, what Walter suggests is that uh, Central to, uh, this, uh, to, to, to Southeast Asian culture is this belief in the soul stuff, which is like an animating force of the cosmos, right? Uh, another way to describe it is that we can think of the soul stuff as a concentration of spiritual power, and that this concentration causes, uh, uh, in what the Malay world calls the angin, right? Or the will or desire courses as a kind of will or desire that is called the angin or the wind, stirring someone into action, into doing things. And therefore, the person would appear very charismatic or influential and often described as possessing a high level of semangat or soul star. So in turn, this person then is recognized as an orang besar or a man of prowess who is capable of captivating those around them and turning them into followers. In doing so, he assumes a leadership role. And this leadership uh, uh, quality is visualized often as a mandala. Uh, a mandala sh typically shows him at the center of power from where his charisma radiates outwards in diminishing importance and influence like a concentric sort of sphere of influence. Uh, moreover, this mandala exists within a galactic system in competition with other mandala of spheres of power. This week, however, we're going to consider what kind of language of politics emerges within such a landscape. Uh, especially when we think about how these uh, realities are not so much expressions of cultural purity, but as spaces that encourage active forms of translation because it is a very uh, unstable kind of political reality and landscape. Uh, and so uh, made up of competing factions. So we will start with this artifact that you see here on the screen, and this was found in Borneo near an area called Kutai, which is on the Kalimantan side or the Indonesian side of the Borneo island. Now, now, when we often think of Borneo, we imagine it is a world unto its own with very little connection to the outside world, almost as if this island thrives on an exceptional state of uh, being removed uh, from larger uh, global conversation uh, uh, of cultural encounters. But we're going to unsettle some of these assumptions and no better place to start than uh, to look at what we have in front of us, which is called the Yupa Sacrificial Post. Uh, now, these, are, the, these were inscriptions issued by a king called Mula Varman, uh, written in, and inscribed in the Brahmi script. Uh, and they are really one of the earliest known evidence of Indian cultural influence on the Malay world dated to sometime in the 5th century uh, common era. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, I, I point this out only because I want to really bring Borneo into the conversation and also to show how extensive is the spread of this uh, so-called Indian cultural influence across the Malay world by the 5th century CE. Having said that, scholars today tend not to use the word influence or the word Indian to describe this process of cultural interaction, since the, using these words then frame our understanding of the historical interaction through perhaps a lens that is uh, more recent, 
and they do not accurately capture the specific dynamics of the historical exchange. Uh, so a term and theory that had gained prominence uh, is Sheldon Pollock's idea of the Sanskrit cosmopolis as a way to respond to this earlier idea of what influences. So instead of India, uh, which is the name of you know a modern nation state that today, we see a prioritization of a language as a cultural feature. Uh, that is unifying uh, and this is taken as the subject for our discussion and then instead of the word influence Pollock, Pollock used the term cosmopolis uh, and this is intentional in that uh, what he's suggesting is that this exchange wasn't just one way it was cosmo cosmopolitan uh, in the sense that when you master the Sanskrit language this allowed the person who used the language to speak back and participate within a larger literary political culture that spans the Indian Ocean. So the term really came from his 2006 book, The Language of the Gods in the World of Men. And in this book, he argues that the scholarly cultivation of language in pre-modern India should be seen in terms of its relationship to political power. And this is a very strongly worded uh, argument that language refers, uh, the, the language that he refers to here is Sanskrit. And it was a language that was primarily used for Vedic rituals. And Vedic rituals are a set of ceremonial practices centered around the holy text called the Rig Veda. Uh, principally involving sacrificing of animals and communal drinking of a kind of mind-expanding elixir or a type of a drink called, uh, made by uh, the Soma plant. So in Vedic practices, uh, these are practices that are connected to what we today call the Indo-Aryan people. Uh, and this is a people uh, who primarily originated from Central Asia uh, but over time, long, long periods of time, and we're talking about uh, uh, two, three thousand, uh, no, three, four thousand years, they spread west to Europe, influencing European culture, and also spread it uh, 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 east, eventually reaching India about maybe three thousand five hundred years ago, uh, and. Uh, uh, perhaps one of the most well-known and enduring symbol that came from uh, this Indo-European people and culture is uh, that we might be familiar with is the swastika. So the swastika is not only prevalently used in Buddhism, uh, but it was also a symbol adopted by the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party, or better known as the Nazi. Uh, and if you were wondering why would the Nazis uh, you know, choose to adopt a symbol uh, that was prevalently used in Eastern religions, now you know the answer lies in the fact that they too trace their history and origin and cultural origin all the way back to their Indo-Aryan past. Okay? So although Sanskrit here uh, was a language of Vedic ritual, it was adopted by the royal courts. Uh, and therefore, by around the 5th century, you see uh, uh, ideas of sort of like power then began to speak through uh, a Sanskrit voice. Uh, and in this sense, then Sanskrit became almost like the premier vehicle for the expression of royal will and displacing all other languages, uh, according to Pollock. Uh, not only that, uh, you have to learn Sanskrit uh, because it is an essential component of power by now. Hence, in the Yupa sacrificial post, we see that uh, the king himself is also 
uh, not only name himself as uh, with, uh, using a Sanskrit sort of like name, right? But we see him adopting an opening phrase from an epic, uh, uh, the, the epic of Ramayana, uh, therefore allowing the king to identify his being and his rule with that of the narrative poem, imbuing this then imbues his life uh, with the significance of the epic sense of historic destiny and the cosmic weight that it brings to bear on his rule, and therefore magnifying his prestige uh, uh, at the same time as he's sort of like inscribing all these, uh, uh, inscribing onto rocks to commemorate his. Uh, uh, his his rule, right, uh, uh, and his, the, the kind of like ceremony, the, the kind of ceremonies that he would perform in order to honor and reinforce his political stability. Okay, so there is a, definitely a very ceremonial character and quality to how you assert and display power. So power is not something that is abstract. It's not something uh, uh, necessarily Foucauldian in the sense. Uh, but if we want to think about power in the region, we need to sort of like think of power on perhaps much more concrete terms. How do you make it manifest? Uh, and, and very often it's through elaborate forms of rituals and protocols and ceremonies that will, you would then be able to learn how to read your place within the social order. Okay. Uh, so therefore, uh, when uh, rulers and priests uh, uh, began to sort of uh, take themselves or take upon themselves as the patron of the Sanskrit as a sacred language, they became custodians, uh, uh, keen to ensure the cultivation of the language, often through patronage awarded to many grammarians, uh, lexicro lexicographers, Matricians, so they sponsor court poetry. They sponsor sort of like uh, huge discussions around, you know, what is the correct way to use Sanskrit. Uh, in this sense, you get a sense that there's a very strong emphasis on what is the correct way to speak. Uh, all of these actors then help to guard the purity of the language. In doing so. Uh, what is sort of like implied here is that when there is order in the way one speaks the language or expresses themselves in a particular language, it is also believed that it will bring about social order. So it, this reality of like social order, peace and harmony, harmony within society is reflected in the way we conduct ourselves in the correct way of using a particular language. And this is the ideal uh, that, that informs uh, uh, the, uh, the very concrete, concrete manifestation of Sanskrit as a, as a language of political power. So when we see here, uh, very often, uh, these early examples would, uh, that have survived the test of time is in the form of stone inscription. Uh, similarly, an early dated sort of fifth century stone on the river bed uh, riverbed of uh, Jarutan River in Bogor. Uh, here we see uh, 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 the, the inscription being uh, carved out on what is called in Java the Batu Kali. Yeah? Kali is a river, so Batu Kali is like river stone, and these are huge rocks that uh, often sort of like uh, 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 maybe a natural sort of like uh, unnaturally. Uh, found in a particular place, but because of their, uh, their, 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 their prominence, their, their visual sort of like prominence, uh, inscriptions would be carved on them. Uh, okay. So central to this, therefore, is this idea that when you master grammar, which is often very complex, and anyone who tried to learn, uh, just to give another example, anyone who tried to learn Latin before will have an idea of what this complexity entails so when learning Sanskrit because they sh ultimately share uh, the, the same origin in, uh, in the Indo-Aryan Indo kind of like uh, uh, grammatical, they share the same linguistic principles uh, rooted in the Indo-Aryan origin. 
So uh, uh, what Paula says is uh, interesting because then he said this really only lasted for about a thousand years. Uh, so roughly from, uh, you know, one uh, uh, common, uh, you know, 100 common era all the way to uh, 1,000 1, 1, common era. So uh, roughly a millennium, right? Uh, after which came the vernacularization millennium from roughly 1,000 uh, common era onwards. Uh, so these are not hard dates, right? Uh, meaning that when we want to try to understand change happening at such a scale, we have to really understand that they're happening very slowly across long periods of time. So essentially what Pollock suggests is that this shift began with uh, minute changes in record keeping where local names then begin to creep in and this later expanded to include uh, a writing of literary text in a vernacular language and the entire process uh, is, he calls it uh, literalization mm. and, and when it comes to this uh, process of literalization it is he defines it as a creative adaptation of models from superposed cultural formations. So what this means is, let's draw from an example that we are more familiar with. Uh, take the English language. A lot of the words that tend to refer to more abstract concepts, uh, very often you'll find that they have Latin roots. Latin, of course, is uh, often regarded as a near European equivalent to Sanskrit because they share very similar linguistic and grammatical features. So uh, in our context then, uh, if you were to think of uh, what are the effects of vernacularization uh, in the Malay language, for example, I've suggested before the very word uh, that means language, uh, which is bahasa, actually carries a second meaning. And the second meaning translates as manners or propriety. So you, uh, you can use it in the sense that orang uh, itu tahu bahasa, meaning that the person knows his language or his manners or his place within the, or the social order. And this, I think, retains the Sanskrit preoccupation with the correct form of the language as evidence of social order and civility. Uh, therefore, this carries over even into our understanding of what Bahasa means as both language and proper conduct. So far, that is Pollock's view of things. Uh, and increasingly, scholars are trying to fine-tune his ideas and in the process discovered that there are evidences that suggest perhaps the process of vernacularization was not something that only began uh, as the, re the reign of Sanskrit came to an end. Uh, so there are evidences that point to there being always the, the use of vernacular expression even during uh, uh, the period where Sanskrit was the predominant language of politics uh, and vernacularization perhaps was a feature that was always there. And rather than seen as uh, uh, an agent that is corrupting or, or disrupting the purity of the Sanskrit expression uh, and therefore is something uh, one should anxiously guard against uh, through the sponsorship of, uh, you know, uh, grammatical symposiums and uh, conferences to deliberate what is the uh, best way to use Sanskrit and the most correct way to do so. Uh, I think uh, what evidence uh, such as the uh, oldest inscription in Old Malay suggests is that uh, perhaps they in many ways coexist on some level. Uh, and this might be a feature in how we can think of the adoption of Sanskrit in our part of the world. It opposes Pollock's interpretation that uh, 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 the, the imposition of sort of like Sanskrit happened uh, 
in, on much stricter terms that left no room for vernacular uh, uh, expression to negotiate its way around this new language that was adopted from outside. So, for example, in the oldest date, the inscription in Old Malay, uh, and this is the Kedukan Bukit inscription, or uh, in Palembang, uh, what you see is that uh, up on the screen here, what you can see is that uh, there are terms that are vaguely familiar even to us today. Uh, the larger, uh, I, I didn't show you the, the full extent of the inscription, but within the text itself, you have words like bulan, bulo, dengan, tetapi, membangun, minum, di minumnya, dua, limong. And these are terms that are very local. Uh, they're either Japanese or they're Malay in origin. Uh, whereas, you can really juxtapose this or compare this to the next line of uh, words where you have samudra, rasya, rasa, rencana, wacana, warga, jiwa, angkasa. These are all much more abstract concepts. Concepts that you cannot hold, you cannot touch, you cannot feel, uh, you know, uh, and the, they, they're not connecting sort of like words as well. As well. They're not concrete, uh, you know. If you want to drink something, it's a very concrete act of drinking. A nyor is a coconut plant. It's something that is very present in this part of the world. But to think of the sea not as loud, but as a samudra, you're thinking of the sea on much more expansive and imaginative register. When you're talking about rasa, you're talking about feelings. You're talking about sense perception and emotional response to beauty. When you're talking about jiwa, you're talking about a soul that it, you know, it's not always, uh, it's not something that is uh, tangible, that you can uh, immediately see with your eyes. Uh, you're talking about something that is abstract, that is beyond uh, what our five senses can detect, right? Nevertheless, uh, these then are sort of terms that, we, uh, that uh, the Malay world would borrow from the Sanskrit language because the Sanskrit as a sort of literary language, language uh, did offer the kind of vocabulary uh, to describe these things, okay? Uh, and then you have the very local terms, terms like wangkang, bangka for ship, and this is connected to the Polynesian waka. So there are a lot of uh, these kinds of uh, uh, cross-cultural, uh, comparisons that are primarily established through linguistic studies. You know, when we do comparative linguistics, that is when you are able to detect layers of uh, cultural affinities and connection uh, between different cultures. So, uh, for example, the Malay word, uh, or the old Malay word for sambal, survives today in the Malay language as sampan. Uh, but also lived on in old Javanese as sambo, and while in the Philippines it was, it's called sambu. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, linguists have then sort of like uh, traced also how it's borrowed into uh, Kanai or Cambodian and Siamese or Thai. Uh, uh, use of this term, sambao or sambao, to mean it's ocean going ship. Okay, uh, and therefore, when we look at something like the Laguna copper plate inscription, the oldest piece of uh, written document uh, found in the Philippine Islands, uh, dated to around 900 AD, what you see is a mixture of Sanskrit, Old Tagalog, Old Javanese, and Old Malay being mixed together in this sort of like uh, that document, uh, I think. Uh, and similarly, when you look at the Telaga Batu inscription, you have all Malays with pal Palaval letters and that is of Indic origin in Palembang. Uh, and you see these kinds of like reconstitution and adaptation and, and versatility uh, taking place all over again. And therefore, even if we were to think of uh, the 
the grammar-centric obsession of Sanskrit, I think uh, to think of it as uh, uh, as a complete and almost like a uh, total imposition uh, of Sanskrit over any local forms of expressions and ways of thinking uh, and ways of speaking uh, is I uh, is uh, perhaps too deterministic and therefore we need to be much I, I think evidences point to a much more uh, robust kind of uh, process of negotiation happening uh, so where are these world, where do they take place I think principally uh, in the 8th century uh, this happens in what we today often call the Sri Vijayan Empire but we use the word empire very uh, loosely, uh, principally, it's a kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the academic terminology is a tassalocratic state, meaning that uh, it is a series of uh, port cities uh, that are fairly autonomous from one another, but collectively they form almost like a network of alliances that makes them state-like. Uh, uh, so uh, some call it Sri Vijaya, but you know some archaeologists don't even think the word Sri Vijaya is the correct term to describe this particular culture or this political system or networks of kingdom. Archaeological uh, excavations have a point to Muara Jambi being an important complex uh, alongside with the Bujang Valley in Kedah, as well as in Palembang. Uh, so like the Bujang Valley, uh, remaining archaeological uh, structures uh, tend to uh, really show us only uh, the brick features or, or the stone construction that make up the base or uh, the lower half of uh, what would essentially be a kind of tiered construction. Uh, therefore, if we were to reconstruct a true imagination, how a base like this would uh, be used as a support uh, for a roof structure, uh, then we are also drawing on much later examples uh, and postulating that perhaps it's origin could be traced all the way back to the Malayo Buddhist past. Uh, and therefore, if you see this drawing uh, up here on the screen, it gives you an idea how uh, the, uh, the, the brick structure itself serves as a kind of raised platform that allows uh, uh, the person who's using the structure to ascend up to a higher platform. Uh, after which there is also a kind of like sheltering feature that takes the form of a tiered roof construction. Another prevalent feature is that leading into towards the entrance of uh, this building uh, is this stone sculpture, relatively huge in size and takes a rather abstract form. But actually, this strangely carved sculpture and, uh, represents a creature that we have already explored previously. Uh, and it is the Makara, uh, a mythological composite sea creature made up of features from both land and sea animals. Makaras are also considered to be guardians of gateways and thresholds. Uh, typically, they are seen uh, and shown to be protecting throne rooms as well as entryways into temples. Uh, so Makaras are found across the Straits of Malacca. Therefore, the Buddhist Malayu network polity, sometimes called Sri Vijaya, uh, is really a cultural geography that sees the Straits of Malacca as contiguous, meaning that it's a passage that connects rather than a division or a border between two different nations, uh, uh, re referring to Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, 
and this idea was really only instantiated much later in 1824 uh, when the Anglo-Dutch Treaty was signed. And during that time, literally what happened was that a line was drawn down the middle of the Straits of Malacca, separating the territories and bringing them into two opposing, competing, but also collaborating colonial spheres of influence. The fact that the Makaras can be found along the Straits of Malacca on both sides of the Straits suggests a shared cultural feature. It's also asking us to think about the relationships between port cities such as Lembabujang and Mora Jambi and their relationship with one another. Though they might be competing, they're also part of a larger network where they are, in some ways, uh, safeguarding the interests of one another. So just to give you a sense of perspective of how huge the complex of buildings are in Mora Jambi, uh, I want to sort of like put that in a comparative scale perspective. For example, with Prambanan and Angkor Wat, as well as Paharpur in Bangladesh, uh, you see here the complex, the, uh, the archaeological site itself is uh, many times the size of uh, Angkor or Prambanan. And if you've been there, you know how big these structures are already. And just imagine Mora Jambi in terms of uh, a scale that is so much larger. Uh, in a way, Mora Jambi uh, function as a very crucial and important way station especially for uh, monks coming from China, Buddhist monks coming from China, who would typically sail through the Straits of Malacca, stopping by in what is called Sriwijaya, uh, very likely to be a site like Muara Jambi, with the facilities of all the Buddhist institutions that you can find. And they would often reside in a place like Mora Jambi for quite a long time, typically uh, uh, minimum six months up to a year, and very often use this time to improve or learn Sanskrit before they sail over to India, specifically to Nalanda University. Uh, and this is a university that was located in Bihar there's today a contemporary university that is also called Nalanda, but uh, you know it borrows its name from its predecessor, and it's not uh, a university, a Buddhist university back then, uh, isn't like what a university is today. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, it is a site of uh, where that gathers people from different walks of life, and they come here, they gather, they debate on doctrinal issues. And uh, it was a site to learn and improve oneself uh, at an intellectual level. Therefore, we need to link what we understand to be Sri Vijaya or the Buddhist Malayu polity to a much broader religious network that spans the Indian Ocean. And it serves as an important conduit uh, uh, that facilitated uh, the movement, an intellectual movement from China all the way uh, to India. Uh, but that's not all there is to it. Uh, there's, in fact, a very interesting story of a particular Tibetan Buddhist uh, teacher uh, all the way back, uh, that goes all the way back to the 10th century by the name of Sir Lingpa Dhammakirti. Uh, and scholars today have speculated that uh, this Sir Lingpa Dharmakirti could possibly have been uh, someone who originated from Kedah, uh, which was then a well-known flourishing uh, hub uh, that's part of the Sri Vijayan or the Buddhist Malayu network uh, alongside with Palembang and Muara Jambi. So nothing of this history has survived the ravages of time in our part of the world, but uh, Tibetan sources uh, did record that there is a person called Dhammakirti, and typically he is known principally as the teacher of 
a very famous Buddhist teacher in Tibet uh, called Atisa. Right? Uh, so Dhammakirti is recognized as someone who came from a place uh, called Suvarnabhumi or the Golden Island. Uh, and in navigation term, it often refers to the Malay Peninsula. Okay. Uh, so, of course, built into this story is how he's discovered a long-forgotten uh, Buddha statue there, and therefore uh, he is also known in Tibet as Ser Lingpa. Uh, in Tibet, this is a translation of a Sanskrit term, Suvarna Dipya, uh, which actually means of the Golden Island. So, Dhammakriti is known to have a small following of students, but of course his most famous student uh, is uh, Atissa, and that's actually how we know about him principally, who became a Buddhist master in his own right. So writing a travel journal, Atissa himself recorded meeting his teacher who came from a city in the golden islands of Sri Vijaya, Suvana Pure Sri Vijaya Pure. Uh, all these are taken as evidence that suggests uh, Kedah was his uh, place of origin. But more importantly uh, is that if we were to think of Sanskrit cosmopolis as truly a space where the learning of one, the language, Sanskrit, facilitates one's participation within a literary and political culture, then Dharmakirti uh, playing a role in shaping a very important strain of Tibetan Buddhism and contributing back into uh, 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 the, the development of Buddhism does point uh, to a two-way sort of conversation. So we don't think of transmission as only one direction, but now we're increasingly paying attention to how this be we can think of cultural exchange and interaction as a two-way conversation.